Awesome. Okay. So tonight we're going to be talking about uranium. Probably just start off with how did you get interested in uranium? Yeah, that's a good question. I can't even remember the the moment where I kind of started to really like it. Oh, actually, I know when. Yeah. So it wasn't even on my radar whatsoever until um, the Wall Street Boys started pumping it. And then I actually then went, oh, this thing's about to drop. This thing's about to fall off a cliff. Yeah. Um, Because that was the peak of that first wave. So then I, I called, the, I saw the rising. Actually, I can, um, I can show you. I'll pull up my chart quickly and I'll show you the exact point where I was um uh, share screen. So looking back on the weekly here, it was this point, this point here when it yeah. was all getting, you know, pumped all over social media. It was the the next best thing since sliced bread, etc. And then yeah, it came up in this ending diagonal here in this wedge pattern. And then that's when I ended up going short. So I knew it was going to correct at least there because Good. I knew it was at the, you know, that was the final wave of that whole move. But the thing is, I knew that that with that end in diagonal, that was actually an impulse move, which means it was the beginning of a move. So then I started looking at the bigger picture. I was like, oh, wow, this is actually the first initial phase. This is where you know, smart money accumulates. It just got to the blow off top of that first move. We're now going to correct that whole move. Oh, interesting. And then, and then go up. So that's that's kind of ha how it came on radio is, yeah, I wasn't looking at it at all here, anything like that. Yeah. It was when it got there, I knew that that one cycle was over. It was going to correct it. And then, um, yeah, and that's why then I knew that this was a corrective wave and now looking to um to go up. So then I started to just really, really unpack it and I just know how markets move in cycles and this thing was going down, went into it sideways, and then yep. now it's going going up. So it's just moved from the three phases downtrend the sideways to now. Yeah. I remember so, from our, our last call you described as think of as a, a person walking down some steps. Yeah, here. So you can see going yeah. down, 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 down. And then you can see they're kind of going sideways and now they're climbing up. So at yeah. the moment, you know, they've kind of gone sideways. So we've had a bit of accumulation or possible accumulation here. Yep. And then if it keeps breaking, if it breaks out above there, then it moves back into the next the next step and keep keeps going up again. So, yeah, you just got to remember that everything goes in cycles. When one asset is overvalued, something else is undervalued. I'm quite bullish on energy. Um, and then uranium is part of that sector. As you can see, it's been a horrible investment since the, <laughs> the, the GFC yeah. and what's been amazing since then, the technology, NASDAQ, stuff like that. So now that, you know, this was an underperformer. So now we know things go in cycles that it should now become a performer. Yep. So, it's yeah. interesting that you got first interested in a corrective move. And that made you zoom out and have a look at it and go, oh, there's a bigger macro play here. Yeah, and that, that's what I do. So whenever whenever anyone always says, mate, what do you think of this? Hmm. Most people go straight to the daily. And the first thing they should actually be doing is go straight to the monthly. Yep. Because at the end of the day, and I said this the other day with Bitcoin as well, is big money doesn't look at the daily. They don't look at the weekly. No. They, they look it's at the monthly. Time. They look at the monthly because that's the primary trend. Yeah. If they're, if they're, and again, they can't buy their whole thing in one hit. So yeah. they have to accumulate the asset over time. They yeah. And that takes months. So if they're going to spend that much time doing it, they're looking at the bigger picture. They're not looking at the daily that can be moved, can be moved around. So um, yeah. So you've got to zoom out and see the big picture on the monthly. And then you can start to see what's actually happening on the primary trend and know where, um, yeah, where, where it's likely likely heading and to be honest less mistakes happen on on the monthly because you can clearly see mm. like look how easy that is you can see it's going mm. down there's less noise and then you can see it go go sideways and you can see it's starting to trend back up again here yeah so yeah that that's pretty much what caught it so pretty funny funny thing is most people would have funneled into there yeah i it just caught my caught my attention there i you know wasn't going even though i knew it was long-term bullish timing yep is really important because if you bought there, you would have then had a 30% drop. So I was just waiting for the opportune moment to start to accumulate. And that's where, where I did that. Started to accumulate on this first 
I thought that was an ABC there. So it started to accumulate there. And then I loaded up again around that last one funnel there before we had had this move here. Mm. But yeah. Anyway, let's get let's get cracking. But yeah, that, what what got you kind of interested in it the first time? Me, uh, I I like buying stuff that's um really unloved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it it tells me that it's uh it's 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 very value. It's um really good value when mm. assets are unloved, especially things that are unloved but are essential, and you're not going to be able yeah. to like walk away from it. And I know that we touched on this chart the last time we spoke about energy, but the thing that really remarks to me is like from the 1950s, the energy consumption has just gone absolutely exponential. Mm -hmm. And and when I compare nuclear compared to all of the other forms of energy, none of them are really scalable. So, you know, we can't scale out coal, we can't scale out oil, we can't scale out natural gas. None of the renewable stuff has proven to be scalable as yet. The only thing that is scalable is is nuclear, and there's a bunch of like political reasons and social reasons why we haven't chosen to. But that's the only one that can continue to grow at the rate that we're consuming stuff, and mm-hmm. that's where I got excited. It's that combination of um, really unloved, really really cheap at historically like decades um, uh, in time frame, and then it's something essential that you can't do without. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the price action, this is kind of like a, a longer term price chart. Right now, it's 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 actually this is taken a little bit a while ago. The price is a little bit higher than that. Do you want to bring back the the price chart again? The yeah, I'll bring it up. One? I'll bring it up live over here. So I've got it on the monthly here, and yeah, we're up at seventy four fifty now. Yep. Um, the key thing is is that we're at the moment we've broken above that resistance level right now. At the moment. So if we can keep the monthly close and we stay above that 70, what is that? 71? Yeah. 71 ish, 72. That's a, a, pr- a pretty good sign. That's a tall uh, green candle. Yeah. that That's a big one there. That's what, why the uranium went ballistic because it took out that high there. Yep. So once it took it out, boo, and again, monthly, see that is where actually where the candle closed there. It's 59. So when this candle closed above there, that's why then you had the next screen run because it's broken out. Most people are looking at the data that incorporate this wick stuff, which is rubbish. Um, but the main thing is you can see it was trending down and look, we're stepping up. So yeah. the trend, the trend is the trend is moving up. And that's the key thing is that each time buyers are stepping in higher and higher, 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 higher. So would you so, be accumulating right about now? No, well, it's not my style. Um, I I've got a lot of good trading mates that, you know, they wait for the trend to be established and they'll buy up in the middle. Yep. My whole style is that I I buy on the first higher high, higher low. So I that would have been my spot there. Let me get an actual proper line in. Um, this one here. Resistance became support. Yeah. So what what that's showing is those sellers have now got exhausted there, and then they become buyers. Buyers. So yeah, that's my whole style. Is I like to look for um, a trend weakening, and then got your wedge ending diagonal there, which is a perfect reversal pattern. So ending diagonal, and then it comes up, and then the minute I get the actual confirmation of it. So yeah. Yeah. That's interesting at that price point. It's around about the twenty dollar mark. The uh, the total all in cost to manufacture, produce ready, and pull it out of the ground, including capital, is like over thirty thirty five dollars a pound. And oh so yeah, yeah. At twenty bucks, you just look at that and you go, "That's a bargain!" Like mm. it's 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 an absolute steal. I am. Um, I look back at some of the um, savvy investor posts. And I think I started to get excited around 2018, 2019. So we, we kind of got excited around about a similar time, but for very different reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're seeing that's the thing. Like you were calling it, but, and you were right too, because look, it started to trend up. And this is the thing people don't realize is that, especially p- person like yourself, you call these things and, you, and you're right. But look at the time, like that's this thing actually bottomed in 2016. Yeah. 
But if you said, oh, uranium is bullish, it's bottomed. You're like crazy. How long is it taken? It's seven years later. Yeah. You know yes. what I mean? Yes. And then like, oh, well, of course you're, you're, oh, you're right now, but actually you were correct. Yes. You know, it had bottomed. But look how long it actually takes to play out the, yeah. the bullish narrative. And that's what, what people don't understand is they don't realize that stuff takes time. They it think when you, when you call something that it's going to happen straight away. Gold and, did the same thing. Gold yeah. ran around about 2015 at about 1,050 mm. US dollars. Uh, that's 2015. That's eight years ago. That's a mm. bloody long time to wait. Mm. And that's why, like, you know, it's kind of like it's more ego than it is actually smart investing trying to get the bottom. Yeah. Because actually the explosive moves don't happen from the bottom. No. It's they the, happen the last from, two years. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it happens in the public public participation phase yeah. and, and the excess phase. So you just want to be in for the public participation phase, not that first stage, which is this one here. You want to yeah. get in now when we're moving into, into the – you know, public are aware of it. Again, no one talked about uranium here. Yep. I actually don't even think it got mentioned. I can't even remember once hearing people on social media talking about it back here in this 2017, 2018. Yep. But first time I, I saw it mentioned was, yeah, that, like I said, the um, the Wall Street boys bringing it up. And then, yeah, and then it got went into that euphoria, pulled back, and then now it's starting to get talked about a bit because we're moving into the public participation phase. Yeah, you make a good point about that public participation phase. I think Catherine Cashmore called it like uh, the tail end of the winner's curse. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes so popular that every man and his dog jumps on the ship and it capsizes the ship. But before it does that, it, it looks like a wonderful candle. Well, that's actually the excess phase. That's the literally there it can't, there's not a bear on the street. Everyone is, that's lithium yeah. last year. Yeah. You know, like if you even, it's pretty much kind of close to Bitcoin right now. If you even try and um, talk about Bitcoin being bearish now, like everyone kind of like will jump down your throat. You're an idiot. You don't you know about the ETF and da 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 da. You know, it's kind of like people are in that euphoria. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, if you um, think Bitcoin's euphoria now, just wait until 2025. Oh, I, yeah, I, I know. Then you'll and see then, euphoria. And like I know, every... I know from the last one too. Like, yeah, I know that this is even close to euphoria. Not even yeah. close. But yeah, so, yeah. So, at this point, you wouldn't be accumulating. Uh, it wouldn't be if you're not on. It wouldn't hurt to get start to get some exposure now. I don't think. Yep. Um, I guess for me now that I, you know, knowing that I got so much lower, it's hard to. It seems expensive now because I got it much yeah. lower, if you know what I mean. Yes. Yeah. Even yes. though even though I still think it'll be cheap compared to what it will be. Yes. It's, you know, it'd be like buying Bitcoin at 6K when you know you got it at 3K. Like you're still going to be happy buying it at 6K because it yes. went up to 60, but you're like, well, but I got it at 3 You know what I mean? So, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. I, I got Bitcoin at 400, so I struggle fathoming like <laughs> buying yeah. more at 30. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard for me. Mm. Um. So if I switch over to the long-term price chart, you can kind of see the the mean price is forty, which kind of makes sense. So if the um the, you've got to share your yep share yep. So if the if the total all-in cost of production of pulling out of the ground plus capex and everything is about thirty thirty five a pound, mm -hmm. and the long-term mean is forty, that kind of makes sense because you actually need to have some margin. Mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. cost of debt, margin for profit. You need a little bit of margin. But where we are right now, look at the price. It's like, it's it's well above the mean. Well, so du it's, double, double cost of production, isn't it? It's double. It's mm. double. And yet the reason why I think it still can support that price is going back to this chart, like the thirst for energy worldwide is so strong and there's nothing that's really scalable. And mm. so there's something that's going to have to bridge that gap and it's not going to be solar or wind, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, there's a really good tool that I use because I'm, I'm not a charting geek and I can't navigate my way around weekly, monthly, annual mm -hmm. candles like you. So as a macro guy, I go to a place called Trading Economics and they've got a whole bunch of charts for commodities, mm -hmm. um, gold, uranium, a whole bunch of different things. And they'll plot out like for, for charting newbies like me, like the 10 year forecast, which I look at that chart that looks quite bullish. Mm -hmm. If you look at the five year chart, that also looks quite bullish. So mm. for a macro guy, I look at the next couple of years, both five and 10 year, 
and I think at the the low and upper ranges, and I think that uranium is looking quite good. Well, I've never seen that site before. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah, it's not Expe- bad. especially for yeah for a new like like yourself, a person that doesn't know TA really. That that's a great yeah great uh, starting point for sure. It's a poor man's TA. <laughs> yeah, no, but to be honest, yeah, it'll work. <laughs> And so when I think about macro, I love this photo because um, I break down macro into four forces. And that's um, if I break that in the half, you've got supply on one side and you've got demand Mm -hmm. and you've got bearish supply and bullish supply and you've got bullish demand and you've got bearish demand. So that depending on a whole bunch of things that happens in a market, it'll either affect supply and demand. It'll either be positive or negative. And Mm -hmm. And the outcome of all of those forces is where price goes. That's that's generally how I think about um, macro. And so when I take that lens and apply that to uranium, if I look at the bullish factors, there's um, non-renewable energy hasn't proven to be scalable. So that's that's bullish for uranium. Yeah, because definitely. All the money, all the capex that's been invested so far has been invested in the wrong part of mm. the energy curve. Um, wind and solar, not keeping up with the demand. Um, it takes time to get nuclear plants up and running. So mm-hmm. that's that's bullish because up until the plants are up and running, um, there's going to be a supply constraint. What is so, the average? What is the average time? Do you know? Over a decade. Oh, that long! Wow. Yeah. Okay. It takes it takes a while because you've yeah. got you've got um, you got permits, you've got to get through the environmental lobby, mm-hmm. you've got to satisfy the regulator. It's it takes a long. What about yeah, old old ones that were running that have been switched off? Yeah, they're faster. Yeah. So they could take um, a, a year to a couple of years. And the mm-hmm. best example that we've seen of that is in Japan. Mm-hmm. So they've recently brought online, I think they've got 11 online at the moment. They've got, uh, they had 50 that were um, up and running all together before Fukushima hit. Mm-hmm. And then they shut them all down. And now what they've got is they've got another 20 or so that they want to reactivate and the remainder they have to decommission because they're too old. Yeah. But yep. it does take some time. Um, the other things on the bullish front is rising energy consumption, which we saw on that very first chart. Oh, yeah. Um, nuclear is extremely environment of, environmentally friendly. It doesn't produce an awful lot of CO2 emissions. Mm-hmm. And there's um, there's some great data I'll show you in a second, but nuclear energy is really cost effective when you compare it against coal or oil or other forms of fossil fuel it's really cheap because mm-hmm. it just produces so much energy um the stuff that's on the bearish side and i think this is where uranium has been tarnished um, over the last couple of years is mm-hmm. mainly um the branding like uh, environmental damage from mining um public sentiment from Fukushima in 2011. Mm-hmm. That was, that was terrible. No one actually died from that. I was really surprised. Like, thousands of people were evacuated, but no one actually died. Oh, wow. Them. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like the bark is worse than the bite, mm. um, but it, it got a lot of bad press and there's no lobby for, uh, well, if there is a lobby, there's, they're not a very big lobby for nuclear mm. energy. Um, on the berry side, is it, it takes an awful lot of capex to get this off the ground. It's not cheap to put together a nuclear power plant. Um, yeah, so they're the forces. And right now, up until recently, the berry side of the forces have been winning. But recently, we're starting to see green shoots, especially with uh, Japan firing up its nuclear power plants, that um, they're, they're finally getting rid of the stigma on the berry side. And the bullish side is, is now winning. Hmm. That's yeah. That's funny. It's funny how you say that because it's so true. People like latch on to like a story, and they, yeah. you know, so they they hear about all this bad stuff about nuclear meltdowns, and it's kind of like similar to like a shark attack. People always get like, <laughs> a, you know, they have these these fear of go, jumping in the water because a shark might bite bite yeah. you and stuff like that. But like the, I've just typed in on my like, person only has a one in 4 million chance of getting killed by a shark. Yep. You've actually got a one in a million chance of being struck by lightning. Yep. But you know I mean? People aren't worried about stepping out saying it's struck by lightning, but they're worried about jumping in the water and stu- in, in by a shark because the media portrays it as this terrible thing that are there and they've made them out to be the bad guys. Just like 
they have with nuclear reactors and stuff as well. They've made them out to be this really bad thing, you know? Yeah. Because it sells news stories. That's why. It does. Yeah. It does. Just like it's, shark shark bite bites do as well. It's a, a when I went back and did the research, if you look at the the bottom of this slide, there've been no deaths or cases of radiation sickness from the nuclear accident. Um, a hundred thousand people were evacuated from their homes, mm. but you know, no one, no one, no one died. Mm. And that was a result of a pretty big earthquake. Like 9.0 is, is quite phenomenal. Yeah. That's massive. And it resulted in a 15 meter tsunami that um, knocked out the Fukushima reactors. That was, that was pretty big. Mm. But I, I think the narrative that's changing now is Japan's realizing that they can't do without it. So they're mm-hmm. they're actually having to restart some of these reactors, and they're coming online. Mm-hmm. Um, and that not only are they starting it, it's getting an awful lot of support locally because you can see there's a quote here: um, "The rising power bills are really painful. I've never seen anything like that." So the the cost of living is basically driving people back in the hands of uranium largely mm-hmm. because of this chart. Um, so until until they find something that can bridge the gap, energy price will just keep going up. Mm. And so that's why they're resorting to um, uranium. But then when you look around the world, it's not just uranium anymore. It's like, it's China. Uh, they're investing an awful lot um, in the next gen power plants. Mm-hmm. Um, this is Germany. Uh, um there was a there's a really there was a really controversial um, clip of Donald Trump telling the Germans that they were absolutely idiots by turning off their power plants because they're becoming so reliant on Russia. And I'm not a huge Trump fan, but he was actually right there, and uh, mm. it's it's actually proven to be true. But it looks like they're reconsidering the decision to shut down their three nuclear power plants and turning them back on, like like the Japanese. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, oh, which market was this? Reuters. And you, I can't see the country. I can't see the country. Okay. Okay. There's one other country. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I accidentally snipped it out when I did the screenshot. Um, the one thing that I'm seeing that's huge, though, is there's a whole bunch of projects to stand up uh, nuclear power plants. And you look at the countries, most of them are in Asia. Hmm. Asia in the Middle I East. I noticed that, yeah. And I, I remember the last time you and I spoke, there isn't anything that's, um, there is no such thing as a developed energy poor country. Yeah. So if you think of the correlation. That was so true. Energy and wealth. And if you go, okay, well, if a country's got an awful lot of energy, they're going to be wealthy. I look at this and I go, well, China's going to be very wealthy. India's going to be wealthy. South Korea's going to be wealthy. And then, like, look at the United States. Mm. It's it's almost like a flippening. <laughs> mm. Of Wait, yeah, I never thought about that. Um, and when I look at the the amount of capex that's actually getting spent on projects over the next decade, let's let's start on the right hand side. So the green the green sixty three percent section that's that's China. Mm-hmm. So China's spending a considerable amount followed by Japan at 10% and then India at 8%. And if you go to the left chart, you can see where they're spending it. So 32% on wind, 28% on solar, which between you and me, I I think that's too much because Mm. those energy sources haven't proven to be scalable. But if you look at the the blue section, 12%, that's that's an awful lot that they're spending um, on nuclear. And it's increased 21% from a year ago. So yeah, wow. what I'm seeing is the narrative is shifting in countries like Japan and Germany. But more importantly, I'm also seeing people stick their hands in their pocket and their CapEx decisions and their spending is mm-hmm. shifting, which is more important. That that tells me that um, um, there's going to be more investment. Um, I love this chart because it actually shows, if you look at the... And the figures under nuclear, it shows you how much it costs the dollars per megawatt hours. And you can kind of compare that to if you just pick Japan, for example, nuclear is $61.2 for a megawatt hour. You compare that against coal, 87. 
mm-hmm. compared against gas, it's 87. You look at Korea, nuclear is 39. Compared to coal, 69. Compared to gas, 83. So across the board, it almost doesn't matter what country you're from. Nuclear is materially mm-hmm. cheaper, materially mm-hmm. cheaper. And so, again, when you go back to this chart and you look at the rate of consumption is going up exponentially, I can't see any other source of energy that's going to be able to provide a cheap source of energy for growing countries. And so I think they're going to have to resort to nuclear. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, let me see. Oh, um, this is interesting. If you go around the world... And you go, well, where is, where is uranium um, manufactured and mined? Like what are the companies around the world? It's highly concentrated. The, the production, 57% of the uranium production around the world basically comes from these top 10 producers. That's phenomenal. As an investor, what that means is it's, it's actually quite easy. So if you're looking for beta exposure, you don't have to look too hard. It's mm. you know, just focus somewhere in the top 10. And then I'd imagine, like within the industry, there's a there's a long tail of a whole bunch of small smaller miners and explorers. Yeah, people forget that BHP's got actually the largest uranium, just because oh, it has so much everything else, you know, iron ore and pretty much everything. Um, yeah, but they forget they got huge exposure to uranium. Yeah, we've got a lot of uranium in Australia. Um, so we produce 6% of total global supply of uranium. Mm-hmm. Um, the interesting thing about this this chart is if you look at the other jurisdictions where uranium is coming out of, like Nam- uh, Namibia, not very safe. Mm-hmm. Kazakhstan, not very safe. <laughs> I mean, uh, Niger, not very safe. And so, you know, God forbid something happens that jeopardizes the supply line in Kazakhstan or Namibia or Niger, mm. and uh, it, it, it will affect the price of uranium very, very quickly. Like if anything, like the Israel, like um, um, Hamas things breaks out in one of these countries, it kills off supply and it kills mm-hmm. a significant chunk of supply because it's so concentrated. Yeah, 100%. In terms of exposure, before I go on, in terms of exposure, what, what sort of organizations or companies are you looking at? So I, I always get, I look at the big boys first. So then I, so I always go go with them and make sure that their charts will look good. So I PDM was one that I loaded up on. Yep. Um, and again, if let me, am I sharing my screen? Uh, no, let me share it. Bring up the chart. All right. So again, looking at the monthly, okay, PDN here, sellers, yep. seller, seller, they're becoming buyers at the moment here. So as long as it can hold above this level here, PDN's doing all right. And again, high, 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 low, high, 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 low, high, high. I was lucky enough to get in right on that part there, which you know, it looks like a very co- common double bottom there on, mm-hmm. on the monthly, weekly. Look at that beautiful. You can see the wick down. So people bought it up. You can see it really easily. But at the time when it was happening, you look at the daily, it dropped 20, 20% in a day. And that was news related. It was, you know, this is the media manipulating stuff. Something about uh, Nambia sh- uh, bringing in something. <laughs> I don't know. I can't even remember what it was now. But I, I actually did a YouTube video the day it happened. And I said, you know what? I've just bought uh pdn here at 53 cents um because when you know where the primary trend's going which is going out to the monthly yeah you know that it's going high and and you're not going to let the short-term trend that can be manipulated yeah um throw throw you off so i was like oh sweet i'm buying buying off this zone here so yeah i I was quite lucky that that happened because i was able to load up there and then she's shooting up but i do want to see here kind of hold because see see how people are selling here Mm -hmm. and now you need those sellers to become buyers so Mm -hmm. i do want to see it step up and start to bounce off this zone here okay otherwise what could happen is that you've got a double and you could start to correct and we could go you know this could be some kind of bigger correction and you and i were talking before about the fact that you know if the market does correct historically energy will correct it just won't correct as much 
Okay. So yeah. during the tech bubble crash, technology stocks and all that, they dropped 80%, but energy only dropped about 20%. So, you know, they'll think it's the end of the world because if this thing went from a dollar and dropped 20% down to, you know, 70 cents or something, they'll they'll think it's crashing. But compared to how other things are holding up, it's probably doing quite well. So, yeah, you just, just have to be prepared that there could be corrections. Um, but at the end of the day, the longer outlook, as you're seeing on the macro and what I'm seeing on the charts, the longer outlook is still very positive. Mm-hmm. It's just, you just got to be prepared that stuff moves around. <laughs> it doesn't just go up in a straight line. And I even get it on Facebook, people messaging me, go, dude, um, uranium's crashed hard. I'm like, <laughs> what? It's down 15%, man. Like, really? Yeah. That's not a crash. That's not a crash. <laughs> um, so I'm like, it's like they always expect it to go up. Yeah. And yeah, so they they like panic. But the, who knows when they bought, maybe they bought here. So to them, you know, they're down in, down in their positions. But yeah, P- P- PDN is one that I'm like, DYL. Yep. Um, same pretty much thing. So yeah, it's ha- hitting this resistance and starting to reject a bit. Yep. These sellers here, I want to see become buyers. So I don't really want to see it go below that dollar fifteen kind of zone there. Uh, BMN, Bannerman, the Hulk. Quite like this one as well. The so same thing. I want to kind of see this purple zone hold here and this two two forty five. Mm-hmm. Um, what else? That was a lot on? more bullish around um, late twenty twenty one. Yeah, and this one's lagging a bit. See how the other ones were up at new highs and this one hasn't actually got yeah, there yet? Yeah. That's actually showing you that it's a bit of a lagger. Like, why is this one not hitting new highs, but DYO and yeah. and, and PDNR? Um, BOE is probably your strongest one. Yep. Because they're actually in massive production. That's actually is making new highs. Yeah. So can you see how like, like, well, hang on, why is this one making new highs, but none of the other ones are yet? Yeah. So you can see who's the leader of the pack. Yeah. So at the moment, Boss Energy is the boss. It's living up to its name. Yeah. It is uh it is the leader of the pack. It's the boss of uranium right now. So yeah, this one, massive accumulation zone. And I, I posted this chart a million times. This is what I'm talking about where their sellers become buyers. These sellers have mm. become buyers. Boom. So that's what you're always, you're always looking for. Because what it's showing you is that the sellers are exhausted here. And not only are they exhausted, but then they've become buyers. How so do it's they kind of becoming buyers? From the way that it's bounced off there. So once, see how you're coming down, then you got like like little small candles there, like a yeah. doji and a doji. Yeah. That's showing in indecision. Think of it like a battle between bulls and bears there. Like, oh, yeah. I don't know if I'm going down or going up. Indecision, indecision. And then see that big green candle. Yeah. That's showing you who, who won the battle. If yeah. that was a big red candle, then you know the bears won the battle because it's a big green candle. You know the bulls won the battle. Gotcha. But you can't tell if it was like if that was new volume or if it's a person who was previously selling who's changed their mind and now buying. So that's the weekly. What you can actually do is you can zoom down into it and start to see. So see how here it's kind of trend in. Down, 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 down. And mm. then when it then got above there, that's where you kind of know because you're like, well, hang on. They're selling here at a dollar at three dollars. They're selling at three dollars. Why aren't they selling now at three dollars? Oh, okay. And that's Seems where it's kind of showing you that your sellers are exhausted. Yep. And then it broke through. And then again, hang on, they were selling here at 315 last time. Why aren't they selling again? Then yep. they're selling, you know, and then you can start to see, oh, there's no more sellers left. Again, going back to what you talk about with supply and demand, that's yep. supply right now. Yep. There's no more supply left. So then gotcha. it, it, it goes up. It, Interesting. Yeah. We both look at the same stuff, supply and demand, but we just use different language to get there. Yeah. 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 And just um, different things. Yeah. Like it's funny, like these charts tell you the story happening as it's happening. It's it's kind of crazy. And yes, often I can see something play on but. I bet you in a couple of weeks, people are going to be saying this or doing that. Mm. Or people, are, and then you see it happen. I'm like, oh, I told you. <laughs> um, yeah, because you can start, you know, where people will start to flip really bearish or really bullish. And then, yeah, 
it's almost like the the market sends it there knowing that the the um the whole crowd will then go to where they're expecting you to you know so yeah they're kind of like my key big boys and then i've yep. got a, a, a couple of other smaller ones as well that i look at as well but yeah they're kind of like my my big positions in the kind of big boys and the smaller ones are they explorers or are they juniors yeah so you got ones like no they're explorers so you got like ones like eight oh sorry el8 elevate yep. again see and again see how this one's starting to kind of break down a bit which is yep. showing a bit of weakness but this zone here needs to kind of hold it can't really break below that level yep. um pen I, st I still got some of that one this is showing again quite weakness see nowhere near the, the highs 35 cents 12 cents so wow, it's a that's why volatile. <laughs> yeah yeah well, exactly. that's the thing with small caps is that they yeah high higher risk but higher reward if they do end up breaking up oh totally yeah so i i, I would need to see it break above above here to see it get any like potential massive moves yep because that's where it sold off before we had the massive drop um i can't think what else i've I'm into now off the top of my head, but yeah, there's, um, yeah, there's a few there. I, I always get into the main big ones mm -hmm. that I really like. And that's where the majority of wealth, you know, just like your, your whole portfolio is, is, you know, you have a lot into your quality stuff and then you'll have some in kind of the medium and you know, just have a small percentage in the risky stuff, you know, maybe 10, 15% because you only need one or two of them to hit and go ballistic and, you know, it can transform your whole portfolio. Yep. So yeah, that that that's my my whole approach. I'm a little bit safer. So um, as a macro guy, I tend to try and get exposure in the beta, not the alpha. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I'll look at a like a commodities ETF, or I'll look at yeah. someone like BHP that's likely to get access to the beta. And yeah, um, I'm not so exposed to the volatility, but then I I also don't get the massive upswing of like finding you know, the next major uranium mm. explorer as well. Yeah. See, and that's where me as a chartist, I can do that because I can see the moment that it, that it turns the other way. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, like, fin like for instance, I knew uranium was going bullish, but I um told my father-in-law, I said, don't buy a stock because I like he, he's in Canada. I'm like, I can't follow the individual Canadian stocks over there and yeah. that kind of thing. So I said, just buy URA. Because yep. then you've got exposure to the thing and yep. yeah, you're not going to get a, a hundred X out of it. Like you might out of thing, but you'll get multiple gains out of it and you never have to worry about, you know, a, a news event, bringing it down or, or th things like that. So yeah, yeah. Ex exactly the same, but me being me, I can, I can track mine yep. and I can track them on a weekly basis and see if they're turning and, and get out early before, before they crash, you know? That's a good lesson about investing to your your strengths and your core skill sets. Mm, 100%. Mm. So it sounds like you're bullish energy, you're bullish uranium, you're bullish gold. What else are you bullish? Oil. Yeah. So oil. yeah, energy, yep. oil, uranium, um, yeah, gold. Um, ooh. Silver. I, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Once not Once yet but I, but I will be cuz silver kind of gets hit a bit when the market crashes because of the in the industrial impact it's got yeah that's true but eventually yeah it it definitely will but from yeah most most co like commodities really most commodities and stuff yep. um but again could correct first yep gold's the only one that might not correct first yep. historically speaking it, it can just keep going but it can also historically correct so it it could go either way. It um, did in the GFC. Yeah, exactly. It did in the GFC, but it did in the tech bubble. So then it's like, oh, hang on, mm. which one? Which one are we following? Yes, because GFC was actually a real estate crash. Tech bubble was an equities crash. Yes. What do we get? What What are we having now? Oh, yeah, good question. Yeah, I, I think at the GFC, all of the major banks needed liquidity, so they sold whatever caught a bid. Exactly, and that's why they sold their gold. Whereas in the dot com crash. That wasn't it wasn't a banking problem, it was an equity no, problem. Exactly. 
So the question is, in the next one, do we think there's going to be banking problem? My sense is probably yes. Yeah. If you, if you look at the strike yeah. that's happening in regional banks at the moment, it, it screams, yeah, there probably is going oh, to be problem. But it's also an equity problem. <laughs> like, yeah, it's yeah, it's both. Oh, it's a bit of both. But, yeah, but you're right. It, it is. There. Well, we've already seen that it, it has been a banking problem. We've already had a glimpse of it Yeah. from from last year. Yep. So, yeah, it definitely. Bank. SVB yeah. Bank. So same thing with the only mat as well, like, um, you know, very bullish in the long term. However, there could be a correction prior to that. Yep. You know what I mean? Interesting. Um, so you know that this is a correction. Are you selling out of positions then or are you just holding? No. Well, like I said, because I can chart them, I can know when to get out. So I'll just hold the uptrend. Same thing with things like Bitcoin and that right now, like, Yep. Even though I'm still very bearish on it, knowing that thinking that it's going lower, yes, I'm I'm very long right now. <laughs> You're very long because <laughs> the charts are telling me that it's still long. You know what I mean? So yes, and that's the thing that people don't get is you can expect it to to go down because that's what everything's kind of telling you. But if the chart's going up, yeah, I'd be stupid to be shorting it or yeah. or not on it right now. So yeah, um, you know what I mean? So you can. You can't be short-term bullish on something because the chart's telling you, but my longer outlook is still bearish on it for uh, early next year, le leading into the halving kind of thing. Yep. Okay. So I'm racking my brains trying to think of what else I'm bullish at the moment because you and I get accused quite a lot of being very bearish, but uh, we've we're mainly bearish on certain parts of the stock market, not all all parts of the stock market. Well, that's why what why, why we get accused because we're often bearish on the things that everyone's really bullish on. But <laughs> when when everyone's really bullish on it, you know you're at the top of the peak of that. You know what I mean? Yes. Like that's, that's the true. thing. Yeah. And then when you're bullish on something, they're not because <sighs> they're at the bottom of the cycle. Yes. Yes. I'm bullish on stuff where no one's even talking about it yet. Yeah. Um, exactly. Um. Okay. Um, okay, so that's all the slides that I had prepared. Um, is there anything else you wanted to cover on Uranium? I might just share my share. Yeah, I am sharing mine. So, yeah, I'll just show you a couple of key things that I look at with Uranium as well. So you've got URA I've showed you. URNJ is another URNJ. URNJ is another one that I check out as well for um, oh. for your junior miners. Juniors, yeah, yeah. So then you want to know how they're kind of performing as well. I do see. like ETFs of baskets. So it, it does give you kind of like <laughs> um, the leverage of miners, but mm -hmm. you're, you're diversified. Yeah. So if you want, you know how you're talking about, you know, I want to play it safe. This yeah. is a way of playing it safe, but getting higher returns as yeah. well. Yeah. Safe because, alpha. yeah. So if you look at this one, this one's already gone up. Yeah. Um, from the lows there, what it's it's already up nearly double. Like it's it's up eighty five percent, but the URA is not. So you, you know you get better returns in this, and you still also don't have to worry about yeah stuff going under as well. You know, and the volatility so, is not as crazy. No, no, exactly right. But more crazier than something than, like the URA than the commodity. Yeah, yeah. So at, same thing. This one is still going up at the moment as well. Yeah. So see, buyers are stepping in. Buys are stepping in higher. Buys are stepping in higher again. So while it's still, while it's above twenty one dollars, it's still in a very clear uptrend. Yep. Uh, the other one is URNM, which is uh, another a Sprott uranium ETF as well. Mm -hmm. So same thing. This one, you know, it's up, but it still hasn't made its new highs yet. Which I'm which I'm waiting waiting for that one. But what I like to do is actually chart the URNJ, which are those junior miners, against yep. the the URA. Yep. And the reason I do that is because whenever it's similar to kind of Bitcoin, when Bitcoin's in a full bull market, yep. what what's outperforming? All of your old coins are, you know, because money's just going ballistic. Boom, boom, yep. boom. Things go on the moon. It's the same thing with with a commodity as well. When a commodity is in a full bull market the junior miners will outperform the larger miners because yep. money is, is going in. Money, retailers have missed the big stuff. So then they're looking for the next one. Think about lithium last year. Everyone's like, oh, look at this junior miner. It's got lithium. And it's like, you know what I mean? They're trying to find the next PLS and stuff like that, you know, yeah. because they've, they've missed the, 
the one that's done 100x so they're trying to find that you know that kind of next gold mine but yeah so if the junior miners start outperforming the larger miners then you know you're kind of going into that risk on part of yeah. that commodity so that's why i look at them and you can see you can see i've charted it before um mm. this was the resistance it broke through became support so from that point there which is when i started to go re really bullish on uranium again yep why are the junior miners outperforming the larger miners so you can risk see the risk on yeah people are because they believe that uranium is going higher in the future yep. so they're piling into the stuff that's going to give them the better returns so that is showing that we're in a risk on environment here right now mm. so yeah that's another another good good way to kind of just check that risk on environment as well i love that yeah that's a good ratio yeah yeah so they're kind of a, a few little things that i look at as well and then you know, if you, you know, I talked about things like DYL. Okay. If they're strong within their sector, you've got to look at them compared to, to the other ones. So the mm -hmm. fact that this one is close to breaking its all time high, it's showing a bit of strength, but compared to that boss energy. Mm -hmm. It's underperforming. It's underperforming. But then you're like, well, we bring up boss B O E. The boss is actually making new highs. So even if you look at the point in time when this one actually made a new high, which was here, that same point in time in DY was down here. Mm. All right. So why is boss making new highs here, but DYL is all the way down here? It's half price of 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 what it was. And I think so, the answer will be in the fundamentals, which it is. is. This one is in pr production. Yeah. Um, this one will be, and will be, but yeah, this one is actually doing it. So this one can actually take take, you know, if realize the profit. Spot, realize the profit right now, yeah. and that's the thing. If if the commodity is doing well, you've got to remember, like you talked about, all in profit is thirty bucks or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Well, if they're let's say it costs them you know, 30 bucks to get it, get it out of the ground and they're selling it for 60, yep. they're making $30 profit. Huge. Huge. If that goes up to 70, yep. they're now making not $30 profit. They're making $45 profit. Yep. But that's not, you know, that's 50% more profit. Even though it's only $15, it's only a 15% price increase on the spot price. Yep. You know, it doesn't cost more to get it out of the ground. So every time the price of the asset goes up, their profit margins go through the roof. Yep. So people always go, oh, do you have a lot to go to my, I actually don't have any physical gold whatsoever. I've got the miners because if gold's going ballistic, the miners are going to go more ballistic and yep. they'll pay, and they'll pay you a very nice dividend yep. because they're going to have so much. It's, it's like the coal miners now, they're going to have so much money coming out of their ass that they don't really know what to do with it. So they just, they reward their shareholders. Or um, go on an acquisition spree. Or going at acquisitions, which means they're growing and getting bigger as well. Mm. So yeah, that's that's my my whole approach is I don't actually ever buy the asset. I buy the best miners in the business of that asset. Interesting. Okay, mm. gotcha. So which I, tend to... I can do because I can read the chart and tell you when it's turning over. Where, yeah. but in your situation, it's a bit harder. I tend to get the underlying asset. I tend to buy the majors. I don't do the minors, although you showed me a good trick in terms of getting the juniors in an ETF. That's that's mm -hmm. a good way to get... Um, a little bit more risk on asset. Yeah. 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 It's a less risky alpha, <laughs> mm. I'd, I'd call it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I might give that a try. Yeah, like if you look at... GDX and GDXJ. GDXJ, yeah. Um, I do own some GDX. I don't own any of the J. Um, all right. So looking at them both now, what are we on daily? Daily. Yeah. So from this is quite interesting, actually, because I'm not sure how much better it's performed right now. They look very So this one's up 65%, and this one's only up. I oh, know they're pretty much even right now, 68, mm. 65. Yep. 
But if you look back on previous bull markets, well, it's not really a bull market there. It's just the COVID. But let's see what it did during the COVID pump. Yeah. There yeah, see, go. 240 to 175. Yeah. So you're getting, yeah, two and a, a half times leakage. your money. Yeah. So you, yeah. And you don't have that, but only when you're in that bull market. But the thing is, yeah, you get more upside, but you also get more downside. So you've got to make sure you, you know, when to get out as well. That's true. You got to watch it a lot more carefully. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, is, there, is there anything else that, that you want to share before we close up? Um, I think I just had one last slide. Let me share that screen. Um, and the last slide is um, technology has changed an awful lot. Mm -hmm. So a nuclear power plant today is very different from a nuclear power plant that Fukushima blew up that was built like 20 or so years ago. The technology. That's actually a good point. Yeah. I never very, thought about that. Very different. Mm. In the same way that if you go to an airport now, like, um, you know, when I go to an airport in Shanghai, I feel like I'm stepping into the future compared mm. to an airport in the United States that was built in the 70s. I feel like I'm stepping in the past. Mm. And so the technology to actually build, design, run Monte Carlo simulations of what's going to be safe with a nuclear power plant, um, the whole um, virtual reality of building a digital twin and building a simulation of an entire nuclear power plant and be able to manage everything using internet of things that runs and operates within that nuclear power plant. All of that capability is so phenomenal now and that's being led in China and you saw the amount of capex that was being spent in China. It's not being led in the United States. It's not being led in any of the major Western countries. So I think that, you know, um, energy consumption is going to continue to increase. Nuclear power is going to have to bridge that gap. All of the major capex is happening in Asia, and um, I think Asia is going to do well. Uh, and China as well. Sorry. China as well. I think China will do well. They've got some headwinds with demographics, mm. and that's the, that one-child policy really stuffed them up. Because um, when you think of GDP expansion, about 60, 65 percent of GDP is domestic consumption. That's like households buying nappies and cars mm. and prams and sending them to school and all that. And because they had only one child, they they basically screwed up a generation and they stuffed up their census. So I think they're short like a hundred million people. And so mm. as a result, the the population of India right now is higher than the population of China because of that miscount. And um, the miscount wasn't of old people. The miscount was people under 40, which is the most productive, the biggest spenders, the people that contribute to mm. GDP. So I think, I think from an energy perspective, China will do well. Um, I think from a GDP consumption and growth perspective, they probably won't do as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bit of a mixed bag. Mm. Yeah, because Asia's, Asia's taken quite a hit. So I'm like, ooh, another chart. You look at something like Bubba and stuff like that, it's been absolutely smashed. Oh, yes. Um, you know, and you even got people like Warren Buffett that loves Bubba. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. They Like, will they turn around or not? We'll see. But that, yeah. that's, a, that's a thing that people don't understand is like, sectors will eventually turn around, but individual individual stocks might not. You know, individual stocks can just keep going down to the ground and eventually be de delisted and can go to zero. But a sector mm. will never disappear. You know, yeah, like the, the utility sector is not going to just all of a sudden disappear or the yeah. health sector. So that's what you've got to remember is that these sectors will go in cycles. So, the you know, the energy sector has been an underperformer it's not going to be an underperformer for the next hundred years. That's not how the world works, you know? Um, and the technology sector will not be an outperformer for the next hundred years, like it has been for the last 20. Mm. So, yeah. That's the thing that people need to understand is that sectors will rotate, but individual stocks, not necessarily because yeah, they have a lot different headwinds and things that can actually send them to zero whereas a sector. Yeah. Mm. It won't. So Barbara, as an example, it's it's almost got two things going against it. One is a tech company, and secondly, it's in China. 
So it's got two rotations going against it. Is it tech company or is it the consumer discretionary? Well, what's it classified as? Let's Google that. So I thought it's kind of like, well, yeah, I guess it, it's kind of like Amazon. So it's probably, yeah, because Amazon's considered technology tech. too. Yeah. Which is, why is that tech? It should be consumer discretionary too, you'd think, you know, because it's spending. Oh, uh, interesting. Um, I think because they provide the platform that actually sells the stuff. Yeah, yeah. But as then opposed if, to... But then if consumer spending goes down, then obviously their revenue goes down because there's less, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's what I meant by double whammy. So one, yeah. money is moving out of tech. And the second thing is because of the one-child policy, GDP is going to take a hit. So you've got two headwinds. Mm. Um, and if anything happens with Taiwan, that's a that's a triple headwind. Um, yeah. Chinese tech companies right now would be a bit of a risk. Yeah. 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 See, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of liking Bubba down at these levels, eh? Yeah. Back at, I, back at IPO prices pretty much. Show, show your screen. Yeah. Um, I love how at the end of the the subject that we're talking about, we just go off on these interesting tangents. Yeah, <laughs> well, you, you don't have to add this to the other one, but I'm just, <laughs> yeah, like to see how this is a ma- like major level here. Like it was support, support became yeah. resistance, support, support, and then support, kaboom. support, support. Yeah, broke through, but then it got eaten up straight away. Yeah. Um, and the thing that really ca- catches my eye as well is it's diverging off here mm-hmm. as well, which is a yep. weakening trend. So that was a weakening trend coming down there. Yep. It's come down and lower in volume as well, which is a good sign. Um, so you know, there's some signals there. I just need to actually see it. I need to see it bounce up and then break above there. If it got above there, I'd be pretty happy. And if it got above there, I'd be very happy. Yep. Because yeah, what it could just be doing is kind of maybe been accumulated here a bit before. Yep. Because, yeah, this is back at IPO prices. Like, that's crazy. Absolutely crazy that it's, yeah, coming. But, yeah, we'll, like, yeah, we'll see this thing. And that's the thing. I bet, yeah, like, everyone would have laughed at you if you thought this thing would have dropped 82%. <laughs> that's a Dobcon crash. <laughs> I know. It is. It really is. Like, Baba, that's- it was well, uh, like a $500 billion company or something. Yeah. Maybe Not higher. Like- not anymore. No. That uh that's that's bigger than the Nasdaq drop, I think. Yeah. Oh. So yeah, no, she's and yeah, like I don't think it's gonna be like a and that's the other thing. People just think when it bottoms it's gonna go up because most people have been investing since the COVID drop and they think that that's normal. Like yeah. that's it was a once in a lifetime. I don't think something like that would ever happen again. That V-shaped recovery like that. Uh, that was insane. You know what I mean? Like that they ain't insane. locking us up and giving us free money ever again. And that's why I've been talking about Bitcoin. I'm like, it only got to 69K on literally the ultimate perfect conditions. Hmm. Like literally money coming out of people's asses. They could have, you know, and not only did they have extra money, but they were at home bored out of their minds. So they just looking online having a bit of a gamble as well you know yep so it couldn't have been better better conditions for crypto to start going ballistic the one thing that i think is even better than those conditions is that those conditions were great but if you look at the previous halving cycles it was just retail geeks like me that had mm-hmm. money into it there, there was mm-hmm. very little institutional money there was some there was some hedge fund money Yep. Some private equity money, but no real managed fund money, no black no. Rocks, no vanguards, no. No. no fidelities. I think the thing that will characterize the next halving wave as opposed to previous ones is we're going to start to see serious institutional money start coming mm. in and they've got much deeper pockets. Oh yeah. But much. but like if 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 the ETF were to get approved tomorrow, do you do you think they would start putting money into it tomorrow? Not straight away, no. No, I don't reckon it. that's and that's no. the thing I, I don't because if they're selling equities, why would they be going which which obviously because they think, you know, risk is we are moving into a risk of environment. Why would they go into a riskier asset like crypto right now? Ooh. It just you know what I mean? Like it just that it just doesn't make sense to me. Like I'm just thinking me myself. Yeah. I wouldn't put money in crypto right now if if i didn't know what i was doing i am now because i know how to trade and get out but 
if I was just, you know, investing and thinking long term, I would not be dropping significant money in into crypto right now. Yeah. So it's interesting that you say that. There's two ways to think of of crypto. The first way is to think of it in terms of volatility. So in terms yeah. of volatility, um, it is risky because mm-hmm. you know Bitcoin is um, <clears throat> highly risky. The other way to think about it is how does it behave? Um, not in terms of price. I'll share my screen. Um, and so you've heard of BlackRock, right? Um, so oh, I have. Larry, Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock. He says that Bitcoin, the way that Bitcoin's behaving at the moment, is playing the role of a flight to quality. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a really good book called um, Layered Money. And the way that it describes money is the Bitcoin is Bitcoin is sits at the collateral layer, layer along with gold. And what you do is you put stuff on top of it that enables transactions, payments, settlement, a whole bunch of other things. Mm-hmm. But because the supply of Bitcoin is so constrained, where it sits is at the very foundation of money. And that's this whole concept of flight to quality. Now, the whole concept of flight to quality is not a new concept. What's new is you've got the CEO of one of the largest managed funds business in the world calling Bitcoin a flight to quality asset. That Mm -hmm. is new. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, going back to your point about, you know, would you be moving your money from equities to to Bitcoin? Um, I think some investors will. And Mm -hmm. those clients, those people will be high net worth individuals and their clients are BlackRock. Mm, Okay. Interesting. Yeah, because I'm... Let me, am I? I'll stop sharing. Yeah, stop sharing yours. I'll come back to mine. I'll just show you. So historically, Bitcoin's only existed from here. From right? 2009. So, yep. Yeah. So it's only ever lived in a bull market. Yes. Okay. And then if you look these prior corrections. Yes. So that one there, which was the 2013 to 2015 crash. Yep. That was just that on the stock market. Like it was a sideways market. Yep. So when the stock market went sideways, Bitcoin crashed 85%. Yep. And then you've got here, same thing here. This crash here on Bitcoin was that cr- that move there. Yep. That was just a correction on the stock market. The COVID drop, the COVID drop. Yep. So going off history, whenever the stock market has corrected, not going on a bear market corrected, Bitcoin has crashed like 80, not, not 90%. We're now made this low, which again, Bitcoin has followed it. Yep. Okay. This is the first time where the market's going down, but Bitcoin's, Bitcoin's going, going up. up. All yep. right. So we have divergence. Yes. They're not doing the same thing like they normally are. Yes. So either it's changed character and yes, it is this new thing that's due to God to fight the safety or, and you know this from gold and, you know, the, the U S dollar and that as well as sometimes, you know, it's historically <laughs> they haven't, they have an inverse relationship. Yes. But there are times when they can go in the same direction. Um, oh, for yeah. time. Yep. But eventually it, one of them's wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, so either this one's wrong and it shouldn't be going up or this one's wrong and it's going to start coming up kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, we don't know yet until we, we get, know. until we get more, more, more data. The thing people realize if we were to break below there, that's the first time that the stock market has ever been in a bear market. That's a lower, low, lower, high, lower, low since Bitcoin's existed. Yep. So, you know, the odd saying this time is different. You should never say, but in Bitcoin's short life, this time is actually different because mm. it's never existed in a bear market. Mm. So the only, only thing that worries me is that historically it's had, I think, an 85% crash, a 92% crash, and a 80 It's always been 80% above. This crash that we've had here has only been 70-something percent. Yep. Which worries me that the, the littlest crash Bitcoin's ever had has happened in the worst macro environment it's ever been through 
and a recessionary environment's on the way. You know what I mean? So I'm yep. almost like, why has the smallest crash happened on the worst macro environment that it's ever been in? And that's where I'm like, is it just the first wave before we then correct it and come down for it for another wave? That's that's what, it, yeah, I just, I can't see this going up if this breaks down here. I just, I can't see it going off history. And unless it has totally decoupled in some some way. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just, I can't see if this thing starts falling off a cliff and we go into thing, I just don't know why people, because remember if Bitcoin goes up, your old coins are also pumping as well. Yeah. I just can't see why those old coins are pumping if there's all this fear and capitulation happening on the markets, you know? I so. think that if there's fear and capitulation in the markets, what will happen is the old coins will move in the same direction as NASDAQ stocks because mm -hmm. they're seen as risk on. But if Bitcoin starts to behave, as Larry Fink suggests, as mm. a safe haven asset, it'll move in the opposite direction. So that's what I mean. Do we get a decoupling of of bitcoin to the old coins as well possibly yeah possibly. so and, and again that that's never happened before no that's but true. it might because it's never also been through a stock market yeah. crashed like it has so i don't know there's there's a lot of stuff and i'll just follow the data um but yeah there are there are some worrying signs uh, uh, yeah i should bitcoin's at a major major level right now that I'd, I want to see how it reacts here, really. You know how I talked about the monthly is the the level that big money goes into. Everyone's thinking it's broken this level, but if you actually go to the monthly, it hasn't actually broken above the resistance on, on the monthly yet. Okay. So it's there right now. It's right on the cusp. Yeah. So this level, I'm about to do a video might even do it after get up the phone to you about why this level is so huge on 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 Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. It's um there's literally about eight or nine different reasons why sellers will, will step in there. So if we can get above this zone here, it will be a very good sign for for Bitcoin. Mm. But that level is huge. I think we'll definitely know by next year. Yeah. Because we'll definitely. know where tech stocks are going. We'll know where Bitcoin's going. We'll see how big that divergence is. Mm -hmm. yeah definitely i i like i hope it is bullish because <laughs> you're positioned that way <laughs> oh well no just because i know how how fast the stuff moves and i know how much money i can make when it does go into that bull market so yeah you know people think i want it I, I don't want it to be bearish it's just what i'm seeing yeah um i'm the opposite but... i don't want it to be bullish yet because it's early yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. But maybe that's what throws people off. Everyone's expecting this, you know what I mean, crash into the halving. Yeah. No one's expecting an early run. So maybe yeah. that's the the outlier as well, you know. It's too soon. Yeah. It's, it's too soon. But why well, see, the thing that I people are like, oh, but then you haven't bought because I sold all of my Bitcoin up, up here. I haven't bought any long term back. Um, so I've been trading it, making money trade, but I'm not, I haven't actually bought long-term. And the reason why is because it, I, I don't see it as value up here. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm like, I can make more returns on something like uranium than I can on Bitcoin at 30 K yep. because really if it's, a, if you're buying at 30 K, what's it really going on a 300 K tops, you know, 200, 100, it's a three, five, 10 X that to me is not huge. Not exciting. No, it's not exciting. Mm. I don't know if I've been kind of. You've been spoiled. <laughs> spoiled because I've I've had like multiple hundred X's yeah. from the old coins. So to me, I'm yeah. like, yes, you've been you spoiled. I mean? Yeah, that's that to me is that's... what I chase in crypto. Not because I yes. can get ten X's on on the stock market. So why would I bother risking it on a potential? You know what I mean? There. Yep. So. It's only the old coins that excite me in here. So that's why I'm saying I hope it does go that because I would love the old coins to start going because I know I can make an absolute killing on it. And I but, think that's why Bitcoin is exciting to the types of clients that would go to Larry Fink and BlackRock mm. because they're not looking for 10Xs. They're happy for doubles and triples. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
You're exactly right. If they can get a double, triple, that to them is awesome. Like if you can take 50 mil, turn to 100 mil, they're happy. Mm. You know, yeah. they, they just upgrade their jet, upgrade their yacht. And yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, yeah, I reckon you just go through edit it and just post, break it up into sections and, um, yeah, and kind of just po post it on yours. And each time you do it, send it to me and I'll, I'll post it on my, on my groups as well. Okay, cool. Okay. Awesome. Cheers, mate. All right, bud. Have and, a good night. yep, I'll, I'll speak to you later, buddy. Bye. Okay, take care. Bye.